Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today in our final lecture for this course, we're going to discuss nuclear criticality safety evaluations, which are sometimes called NCSEs, CSEs, or CSAs. As we review the guidelines for CSEs, you'll find that this lecture has a bit of a regulatory, law-ish flavor to it. Consider this episode to be a lesser version of a Legal Eagle video. If you're not familiar with the Legal Eagle, he's a YouTuber and lawyer who famously discusses law in pop culture, movies, TV, and other media. However, I am not a lawyer, I am not qualified to give legal advice, and I don't have nearly as many nice suits as the very handsome Legal Eagle. You can perhaps think of me as a discount version of him, perhaps as a Legal Schmeagol. As we discuss these criticality safety evaluations, I will be referencing the DOE 3007-2007 standard, which was compiled by a team of criticality safety experts to serve as a guide for preparing criticality safety evaluations in DOE facilities. Facilities will generally have their own specific format for preparing criticality safety evaluations, which you would have to follow if you were a criticality safety engineer at that facility. But this DOE standard still provides a good overall picture of what should be in a criticality safety evaluation. I've posted a link to this standard in the description for this video. Our old friend, the ANSI ANS 8.1 standard, states in section 4.1.2 that before an operation with fissile material is begun, or before an existing operation is changed, that it shall be determined that the entire process will be subcritical under both normal and credible abnormal conditions. This determination shall be accomplished by considering the amounts and types of fissionable material used in the system or process, by establishing control parameters that affect criticality safety, and by setting limits on those parameters. The purpose of a nuclear criticality safety evaluation is to analyze the criticality hazard associated with a fissionable material process or system and to develop limits and controls to prevent a criticality accident. A criticality safety evaluation shall contain sufficient detail, clarity, and lack of ambiguity to allow a peer reviewer familiar with the facility and processes to independently assess the adequacy and accuracy of the established limits and controls, and of the criticality safety evaluation. So what's in a criticality safety evaluation? First, a CSE will start with an introduction, which describes the scope and purpose of the CSE. Any relevant background information should be stated here such as whether this evaluation modifies or revises an existing evaluation. Next, we have the description, which describes the system or process for which we're developing this CSE. Illustrations and graphics are welcome in this section, as are necessary assumptions about the process or scope of this evaluation. If the process is partially covered in other CSEs, or if there are any other references that help to describe the operation or its potential to interact with any other systems, then they should be cited here. This section should not describe assumptions made for any computational models involved in this analysis. These assumptions should instead be included in the methodology section. Next, we should list any unique or special requirements that are relevant to this process that are not usually associated with or documented in CSEs. While we don't need to document rules, DOE orders, or ANSI ANS standards that are routinely applicable to criticality safety, we should discuss any specific technical guidance or requirements that are especially pertinent to this particular CSE. Next, we can discuss the methodology and validation methods that have been used to establish the subcritical limits for the CSE. There are four methods that are routinely used to establish subcritical limits. These approaches are, first, to reference national consensus standards that present critical and or subcritical limits. Next, to reference accepted handbooks of critical and or subcritical limits. Third, 
We could reference experiments with appropriate margin or adjustments to ensure subcriticality given uncertainty in the experimental parameters. Or lastly, we could use validated computational techniques, such as the methods that we have discussed in this course. Most likely, we will pick one of these four options and justify and defend its use in this section. When documenting these methods to establish subcritical limits, the analyst shall develop and document margins that are to be applied to the limits for the operation to protect against uncertainties in process variables and against the limit being accidentally exceeded. When our limits are based on reference documents, such as the ANSI ANS-8 standards, criticality safety handbooks, or published experimental results, the CSE shall cite the complete and specific references. The CSE should also discuss the applicability of the reference data to the operation being evaluated. This discussion can reference the similarity metrics that we have discussed in this course, such as C sub K. This section should also discuss the calculational methods and codes used to develop these subcritical limits, including which cross-section libraries are used for these calculations, the computing platform used for these calculations, and any code installation verification information. The ANSI ANS 8.1 standards section 4.3 describes requirements for code validation and bias estimation methods. The CSE should follow these requirements and will usually cite detailed validation studies to demonstrate compliance with these requirements. The DOE standard mentions that various methods can be used to interpolate or extrapolate code bias estimates, including the fabulous Tsunami and Tsunami IP codes, which I of course cannot recommend highly enough. Next, we move to the process analysis section, which the standard states that we shall include in the CSE. In this section, we will document and analyze all normal and credible abnormal conditions, and document that the process shall remain subcritical under all of these conditions. This section shall also identify all controls developed to ensure that the system remains subcritical under these conditions. When performing the process analysis, the standard recommends that criticality safety analysts should follow these four steps. First, we should obtain first-hand knowledge of the operations and systems being evaluated. Second, we should understand and analyze the range of normal operating conditions and demonstrate that the process remains subcritical under all of these conditions. Third, we should identify, analyze, and document all credible abnormal conditions and show that the operation will remain subcritical under all of these conditions. And lastly, we should select the limits and controls for the operation. A criticality safety evaluation considers many factors in the analysis of normal and credible abnormal conditions, including operating limits, physical and chemical conditions of fissionable material, and equipment failures. Things like whether the fuel is in a solid or liquid form affect what credible accident conditions are possible. A well-prepared CSE relies on controllable factors for establishing the limits and conditions considered in the process analysis. As we discussed earlier, a passive control is preferable to an active control, which is then preferable to an administrative control. The standard encourages us to use sound engineering judgment when selecting our controls. This sound judgment is also how we should estimate what constitutes a credible upset condition. For example, if we anticipate an over-mass upset, how much excess mass is the operation likely to see? Or, if we lose moderation control and water mixes with fissile material, where is the water likely to intrude, and where is the resulting mixture likely to go? The standard cautions nuclear criticality safety engineers to not make judgments outside of their area of expertise, which is again why it's important to rely on knowledgeable experts when quantifying credible upset conditions and also why nuclear criticality safety staff must collaborate and cooperate with operations personnel when quantifying these conditions and developing the criticality safety evaluation. As we discussed earlier in this course, we should be working with operations. They are a valuable resource, and we should never see each other as the enemy. Lastly, the standard recommends that our process analysis should require at least two unlikely, independent, 
and concurrent changes in process conditions before a criticality accident can occur. In other words, our process analysis should adhere to the double contingency principle. As mentioned before, this is a should statement, but it's a very strong should statement. After completing the process analysis, all limits and controls derived in the process analysis shall be summarized in the Summary of Controls and Assumptions section. It may seem like we're repeating the controls that we just discussed in the process analysis, but the point of summarizing and documenting these controls is to aid in their implementation after the criticality safety evaluation is completed. With that, we have just about finished our CSE. We should include a Summary and Conclusions section to highlight any restrictions on the range of applicability for this criticality safety evaluation, any unique requirements, or any special limitations in the evaluation. Follow the conclusion section, we can also list references, appendices, or a discussion of CAS systems as appropriate. This concludes our review of criticality safety evaluations. This lecture in no way provides a complete summary of criticality safety evaluations. As I mentioned before, most sites will generally have a standard template for CSEs that their criticality safety analysts must follow. Similarly, most sites require that analysts receive ample training and certification before they can begin practicing nuclear criticality safety, and this training may involve multiple subjects that I have not discussed in this lecture or even in this course. But with that, this concludes our course lectures on nuclear criticality safety. The nuclear criticality safety field is very active and very welcoming for newcomers, and I encourage anyone who is interested in joining the community to reach out to criticality safety professionals especially at American Nuclear Society professional conferences. We're all generally pretty friendly and generally pretty happy to meet new people. I hope that you have enjoyed and have learned a lot from these lectures, and stay safe out there.